All right. Good morning, Layman. We got a shout out and a question from someone who watched our last video with uh, John Verveke on rethinking religion. And I thought it'd be nice to get together and just uh, respond to some of the points he raised and some of the questions he asked. Doing videos like we do, it's, it's kind of a lonely thing in a way. It's like you put it out there. It's not like the discussion forums we've been involved in for years where there's typical immediate you know, engagement over a long period of time and you can really dive deep into something. With the videos, you kind of put it out there. It's a product. Maybe some comments come in and we do have some regular commenters who I appreciate, but it's not at all the same kind of level of engagement that, that I think either of us were used to on the forums before. So it was nice to me to have this video uh, response from a viewer, uh, Dan, I believe his name is Coughlin, is his last name. So we really appreciate that. And I'm, I wanted to just say good morning, welcome you. And then I'm going to play a little bit of the, the video so you can, everybody can hear what his question is. Uh, oui, hello, bonjour. Uh, it was, uh, yeah, it was nice. I mean, I, <laughs> I'm terrified about a future in which we're receiving all kinds of commentary and most of it negative, but when it's a small amount and it's positive, um, then it's fantastic. And I thought the video was very intelligent and very sincere and immediately made me want to engage with it. Yeah. Yeah. Same here. Hello to the three sages. Bruce Lehman and John, um, I have just watched the Rethinking Religion part two, and you can imagine that I am a really enthused audience member who's shot up their hand with a question. So if you'd fe uh, field it, that would be really appreciated. Also, just an expression of gratitude and appreciation for the conversations that you're having together, this one in particular, and individually and sharing, um, it's really appreciated. So I'll off the bat state the, the question and point at the area that the, the question is getting at and then, and then I will uh, comment on, try to elaborate or the, the fumble around that trying to give more of a sense of the, the, the import that this question has or, or for myself or where it's coming from more, so a further articulation. It has to do with where you came to at the end of the conversation and where you seem to be aspiring for further conversation. So the death of God and what de um, grieving that death means. So the grieving process of that loss. The, the ask is that you, is that you, the ask and the encouragement is that you articulate further what that uh, what that loss means, what it means to to live in that, to live with that death. Um, the 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 reason for asking and the reason the the sense of the import of the question is that the things really seem to come ahead in that moment. So I understand that in a, in a wider context, the, the meaning crisis would be, uh, and the articulation of that would be in a, on a, an articulation of the thing that I'm talking about. But in this conversation, that all seemed to come to a head in this very specific loss. And the religion that is not a religion that you have been speaking about seems to be finding some kind of definition in its dealing with this specific with this specific loss, so the 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 loss of God, living without living without God. So the the ask is that you articulate that that further. It's just like narrow in on that. The the motive or the 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 import that I feel with that and how it would benefit me is that as 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 much as one can can genuinely and or authentically want to move toward grief in, in, in the painful recognition that, that it's something that one would be benefited by, or it, it is important to go through fully, uh, what would enable or afford the full grieving process by going into the depths of it is a, f uh, a, a full articulation of, of what you, what you, are living in the loss of so what you don't have uh, what it means to to yeah to 
occupy a space where where that loss is existent. And another way to say that the the import is that the um, I really agree with what Bruce was saying, and that there's this um, the crying itself or the the grieving itself is a a kind of knowing or seeing that is. Uh, contained in itself or valuable in, in itself that that it, it's going to afford a kind of seeing that you would otherwise not be that would not be available to you and so coming to that cry coming to into the grieving process is is important in terms of entering into a more intimate relationship with reality and yourself and being able to live in the world more authentically what what seems to be a difficulty though is is even coming to the appreciation of what is being lost um, so i realize that this question uh, framed in another way could also be asking you to articulate god so i i know it's not um a small a small task but this this approach might might also be beneficial in that it's it's, it's not asking for that articulation specifically it's more it's more for if anywhere for us in this moment we we approach the meaning of god or we approach god by falling into the cry of grief and realizing the the absence or or, or the lack so the work that we can understand as being important is eliciting or affording affording that grieving process and this is what you were saying in terms of what the religion that is not a religion could be it, it, something that that provides that context where that grieving process can happen so again the question is like what what does it mean to to live with that loss what what has been lost um what are we lacking um <laughs> it's it's a it's a peculiar uh, circularity in that in that approaching approaching that cry uh, what what one what one seems to need to cry out to is god um and is it that that cry maybe that the 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 coming to the point of crying is the is the non responsiveness of what is being cried to um and so you, you actually need to wail uh, in order to be replied to or in order to have a response of sort um and then the the yeah so i feel like i'm just going to um uh disintegrate or degrade less and less gracefully so i'll leave the question there with um a final appreciation for this conversation in particular and the conversations that you are having more generally Thank you. Yeah, these are really, you know, great questions. And I'm hoping in our conversation with John, we're going to be able to go into uh, some, I, I think Dan gets really at the heart of some of what we'll probably be looking at uh, with the next discussion with John. So part of my response here is just, I'm hoping whatever we share here will just be a, a little taste of what is yet to be unfolded in our conversation um, whenever that takes place next. And I want to leave it open-ended. I don't know where we're going to end up. But just from my side, in raising the question initially about uh, the, the, the process of, of crying as a practice of, of, of the, and the importance of grief work, I was thinking really of a more general and multifaceted thing not that we're grieving for one thing, but globally, there's so much going on that really requires our, our, our felt engagement and our acknowledgement and our digestion and our confrontation uh, that we're not doing collectively as a culture. 
uh, you know, I mentioned the interruptive uh, mechanisms, and there's a lot that that pushes us away from really going deeply into many of the things that are unfolding planetarily right now. So I was thinking of a, a broader, more global grieving in a sense, but I do agree that there is, especially for Western culture and the meaning crisis in which Western culture primarily finds itself, the, the death of God is, a, is an event and is a rupture that really hasn't been fully processed or engaged, you know, in a healthy way. Uh, there's a, a profound decentering. There's a God-shaped hole at the center of this particular civilization that hasn't really, I think, been healthily confronted and gone into. And so I, I think it's a really interesting question. And I agree with John's intuition that this is a pivotal thing, uh, a, a pivotal process that, that needs to happen if we're going to open to new vision. And so I, I'm looking forward to, to going into that. You know, not all cultures around the, the planet have gone through this kind of decentering, um, this auto deconstruction from inside and the, the death of its God. Uh, you know, I can think of, you know, in, in Nepal, it's still strongly spiritual and religious culture, and they have gone through a rupture through the massacre of their royal family. So that has decentered the culture, and they're in a period of chaos and disintegration right now. But that's an externally imposed thing. Or if we look at the Lakota, um, Native American tribe, they've spoken about the, the breaking of the hoop after they were defeated by the U.S. Army and confined to a reservation and a lot of their spiritual practices outlawed. They've also gone through a really profound disruption, a rupture that's, that's decentered them and led to a lot of internal chaos and sense of meaninglessness. But in both of those cases, just, just examples, these are events almost happening from the outside. It isn't the auto deconstruction of the culture of the foundational concepts and orientations of the culture. And that is something that's happened for us as, you know, Judeo-Christian civilization. And so I, I think it's a profound thing to engage with. And for me, looking at it, obviously, it's not really the death of God. I mean, if there is no God, then God never died. And if God really exists, then God could not have died. So what we're really looking at is our death to God, our death to a particular relationship and way of framing and ordering the world and inhabiting the world, drawing inspiration from the world, orienting towards our own future projects and uh, our own present you know, engagements and relationships. All of that has been ruptured, I think, like a, a child uh, in the reproachment phase where there's that, that rupture that happens and the parent can no longer be the center and they find themselves in a state of alienation. And there is a period of, of instability and, and loss of center and meaning uh, before there can be a, uh, a regrouping and a reorientation. Uh, existentially, I, I would also say, uh, you know, on the way to becoming a centaur, on the way to becoming an integrated being, there is this confrontation with shadow and this this bleeding out of meaning from everything that we've invested in, uh, the entering into a dark night and a confrontation with uh, our limitations and our weakness and our mistakes and the loss of a meaningful center to our existence. That, that existential crisis typically precedes any kind of higher unfolding that we would look towards as an integrated way of being or a transpersonal way of being. So it does seem that possibly our culture is going through the, that, you know, its own existential dark night. And, uh, you know, the only way out is through. And that can lead to, you know, a lot of chaos and even madness and so it's, it's understandable that a culture would avoid it. 
but I think it's something that that needs to happen as as the crises around us mount. And so I think that's as much as I would share right now. I'm, I'm anticipating a lot more that we can unfold in our future conversation. Yeah. Uh, obviously, we'll get deeper into this with John. Uh, things I'd like to go toward in that conversation are sort of thinking through how the stages of grief might play into this. Uh, I think it's really important to look at when it's useful to push or amplify our sorrow and when that's a romantic way of jumping past the delicate edge that we need to stay with. This notion of the interruptive mechanisms that prevent the grieving, I think is really important. I'd like to trace, uh, you know, some of Nietzsche's ideas about thinking our concept of God as already having been contaminated, as already nihilistic and self-sabotaged and dying all along. But right now, I'd like to zero in on one facet that really intrigues me, uh, which is a sort of the abstract hyper object that we're pointing to with the death of God. So th this is where I think it gets really pertinent to Dan's query, right? What do we grieve when we grieve the death of God? What is lost such that by staying with that loss, we deepen our ability to feelingly process it in a way that affords us authenticity for the spiritual condition of our epoch. And, and what's lost is certainly not our capacity by temperament or state change or radical insight to encounter perceptions of omnipresently pervading or uniquely overwhelming divinity. We still have that. We can and should be having and blending those experiences with our lives. So what is lost? I would say very abstractly and generally that what's lost is the sufficiency of the particular to instantiate the universal. So when a parent tells a child that everything's going to be okay, often, hopefully, the child can trust that in that moment, even though, of course, it's not a comprehensive objective statement that everything is going to work out. But ideally, the child can relax his or her heart in that particular circumstance. For that moment, things in general are okay. If you can sink into it, sinking into that moment as if other moments did not pose a menace. And the God we've lost is like that moment with that parent. The adequacy of the local situation to accommodate the general situation. We've lost a bit of that. It's permeable now. It's an imperfect container. We might appreciate that they were willing to tell us that everything is going to be okay. But now we know they cannot say for sure. And this will agitate our rest. So when you go into your temple, you, you in the modern and postmodern world are aware that others somewhere else are worshiping differently, that it's a contested topic, that this particular form does not encompass all the options, right? The, the specific signifier God no longer seems to encompass the totality of our possible mm -hmm. concerns. Right? The sun does not adequately represent the whole sky. The, our Bible is not enough. There are other important books. Our, our counsel of the wise maybe formally felt itself to be sufficient to act on behalf of all things. But now it points out to itself that we're all middle-class white men with university educations or something, right? We're aware that something's being left out of the particular instantiation. It can no longer trust itself to act and be adequately on behalf of the universal. So God is dead when you almost always instinctively have to at least wonder whether or not the one you love is really the one you love or is the only one you could love. Whether, you know, when you have to wonder whether the universe can really be understood completely through the poetic metaphor of being a person like ourselves. We used to be able to do that seemingly with a clean conscience to treat the particular as actually being the universal. So God as a singularity that is treated as if it conclusively describes the totality, that's dead to us. That's what we've lost. And that is something that's, you know, hyper object like it's fractally distributed into many, many areas of our life. And by circling through those and seeing that common pattern all over, I think we come to behold and stay with the loss. Yeah, well put. And I think uh, Judeo-Christian Christian culture gives us a 
archetype, a metaphor to look to, which is that it's, it's in the death of God that we come to God. Uh, it, it, it requires, in a sense, that I think that that's something that, that Dan was pointing at in that if you're going to be adequately and deeply really grieving and crying about the loss of God, in a way, there has to be, you know, the divine presencing in that act. Um, and, and in, in fact, it, you know, what's, what's the deepest apex, <laughs> the deepest and most apex meaning towards which we are orienting in that profound feeling of, of, of loss. And so I, I think, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about Panikar and, and the way he talks about maybe God did die, but God was reborn within us as our own depth dimension. And that's, a, that's an interesting formulation. And I think there's some meaning in that. And we could go into that in possibly with our talk with John. But it's something that I would not want to rush towards and not to hurry towards uh, the quick adoption of something like that. I think we do need to pause, not indulge in, but pause with uh, the grieving and, and the real sense of loss of, of primal modes of orientation and relationship that have been ruptured, just as you were pointing at. Uh, so, yeah, there's a lot there to explore. And I think, you know, of course, we're just touching on it. And I actually don't even know where my own thought is going to go on that. <laughs> um, so I'm looking forward to just seeing how it unfolds. Yeah, I, I know part of my understanding of it, but there's more on the tip of my tongue, so to speak. There's a um, you know, this idea that in the death of God, God is reborn in us. I think I would, I would tweak that a little bit. I think the the death of God, the event of the death of God is reborn in us. And by going through the grieving, we enact the shape of the death as the shape of the God that is being reborn, right? So when I say that the particular is no longer sufficient to instantiate the universal, you know, how does it work then, right? The, the particular's failure to be the universal is, is another kind of a shape. That's the shape of the whole, the God-shaped whole, right? So we can't fill it with the shape we thought it had. We have to fill it with the shape that initially appears to be its loss. And then reciprocally, we have to, if we're cognitive beings, find that shape all over to be with that shape and behold that loss. I love how you put that. And Jean-Luc Nancy also points to Christianity as ultimately needing to do the same for itself uh, in that it find, you know, as its own central deity figure dies for the fulfillment of all, in a sense, he's saying that Christianity itself, the more that it begins to enact and adopt that as its central meaning, will undo itself, will begin to embody that very undoing. And I think that's something that's happening collectively, um, but it must be internalized as well. Yeah, I would, uh, I mean, I'm half tempted to recount Nietzsche's parable of the madman, where we get this phrase from, because uh, it's not just the people who self-identify as the believers that are in this situation, right? The, the God of which we're speaking holds sway over people who have not encountered the shape of this loss, right? A lot of people are facing that in the ecological civilization scale, right? We, a, if the particular was adequate to instantiate the universal, then we'd go, oh, uh, if we continue to be what we are and do what we do, things will be fine, right? That's a kind of shared confidence our ancestors had. And in many ways, much of the system that still governs the world is faithful in that sense. But that God is not sustainable, right? Everyone who has a look goes, oh, if we continue to be what we are and do what we do, it will fail, <laughs> right right that that trust is gone this particularity cannot hold sway over the universal it doesn't work uh so there are today many people who have still to encounter that who we don't think of as 
Christian or Muslim or Buddhist. They might just be secular members of liberal society or something like that. But they hopefully will be broken upon this rock sooner rather than later, because we need to go through that grieving and restore ourselves to help humanity get its groove back, so to speak. Right. right. Uh, right? And if, and so that's one of the beautiful things I think Nietzsche did was it sort of really articulate that the problem is not people who identify as Christian believers in God. It continues in modernism. It continues in postmodernism. It's an unspoken mode of being that has to be um, confronted with God's death and hold itself voluntarily in front of that death so that it can emotionally appreciate the consequences. Right. You know, uh, one of the phrases that Panikkar uses that initially in the theocratic and the theological societies, uh, the God-centered societies, people moved with a sense of cosmic confidence is what he called it. And that cosmic confidence has been eroded. Uh, we don't have that center that says everything's going to be okay or that everything can be understood or that there's, there's something that's going to hold through this and that we have access to that. We're really confronting a, a deep, profound inadequacy and a not knowing. And that's, you know, it's understandable why culture moves instinctively away from that or represses that or does whatever it can to uh, avoid really deeply confronting and processing that. But I think that's the time that's upon us.